And today we've got a crazy cool topic. We are talking about mindset. And before we jump into the science and the cool tactics that you're going to be able to apply to your life to change your mindset, I want to just remind you that this episode is part of a month-long series that we are doing here on the Mel Robbins podcast about the building blocks and the research that you need to know in order to create a better life. Here's the simple truth about your mindset. Your mind is either working for you or against you. That's what it's doing. And so by the end of today's episode, there's going to be a couple things that go down. First of all, you are going to understand that you have the power to reprogram your mind. That's right. You can take simple steps and you can practice them every day to train your mind to work for you. And I'm also going to prove to you today, using very simple science, that your mind is trying to help you. It doesn't know any better if it's working against you. And when you can identify the way that you want to feel or what you want to do with your life, you can change your mindset to help you. And when you do that, here's what's super cool. It improves the day-to-day -day experience of your life, and it changes what it's like to be in your head. So whether you're listening to this episode because you struggle right now with overthinking or feeling unworthy, or maybe you have a really positive outlook, but you just want to level up. You want to play a bigger game. That's where I am right now. I am so ready to take a bigger swing, to knock it out of the park this year. And the mindset and creating a more powerful mindset, that is a tool in your arsenal to help you achieve anything that you want. So today, you and I are going to get serious about making your mind work for you. And I want to start us off with a question from a listener named Brandy. Hi there, Mel. My name is Brandy. How do I stop the spiral of negative thoughts and feelings? I really want to reset and start embracing a happier life. I just don't know where to start. I hope you can help. Brandy, I am so happy that you asked this question because we have received thousands of versions of this question. And I'm also kind of thrilled. I picked your question in particular because you use the word reset. And today I am going to teach you how to give yourself a mindset reset. And I'm going to explain what a mindset reset is, the simple, step, the simple steps to doing it. It's all going to make sense in a couple minutes. But I want to give you a preview so that as we step into the process of giving yourself a reset mentally, that you have a baseline understanding. So here's a preview of what we're going to talk about, okay? You have a filter in your brain, and I'm going to teach you, using science and neuroscience, how to use this filter that's already in your brain to your advantage. And everything that I'm going to teach you, you can put to practice immediately. And what I love so much about this conversation that we're about to have is that you may even experience an immediate change the first time you try this little thing I'm going to teach you. This is so cool because the moment you experience this small change in your mindset, it will create momentum. It creates excitement. It creates possibility. There's this opening of a whole new way of thinking. But before we can get there, I want to just start with the basics so that you feel really empowered around the topic of mindset and around reprogramming this filter in your brain. So let's just start with a definition so we're all using the same terminology. And let's define, you and I, what is a mindset? Well, your mindset is your beliefs and your opinions about the way that the world works. That's the definition when you look it up. However, you know that I prefer metaphors. Mel Robbins is dyslexic, so she likes to be able to visualize something, especially when we're talking about this intellectual stuff, okay? So the metaphor that I love when it comes to mindset and the sciencey, psychological, neurological aspect of mindset and brain programming, is I use the metaphor sunglasses. I think about your mindset like a pair of sunglasses. So stop and think right now about your favorite pair of sunglasses. I have these sunglasses that I have had for almost 15 years. I bought them because we were going on this rafting trip and I had forgot to pack my sunglasses. And so I bought the only cool pair of sunglasses that they had on that turnstile thing on the counter. They were like 15 bucks. And they are these huge black bug-eyed glasses. I feel like Jackie O when I wear them. So think about your favorite pair of sunglasses for just a minute. 
Now, I want you to think about the lens color. And think about how when you put on that pair of sunglasses, that lens on your favorite sunglasses, it colors and filters what you see, and it gives it a tint, right? I mean, if you put on rose-colored sunglasses, the world has a rosy, bright tint to it. If you put on amber sunglasses, same thing. Gray, same thing. My big, black, bug-eyed glasses that I just love. I feel so glamorous in these $15 plastic things. Everything looks crazy dark. Just really blocks everything out. Your mindset works the same way as a pair of sunglasses. Let's go back to the written definition of your mindset. Your mindset is made up of your beliefs and your opinions. And just like the lens on a pair of sunglasses, those beliefs and opinions that you have, they create a mindset through which you filter the world. And I'm going to give you a couple examples. Let's say you're a pessimistic person. If that's your mindset, if that's your outlook, you will filter the world through pessimism. Just like a dark pair of sunglasses skews the outside world with this black and darker shade. And if you're not pessimistic, let's just think about the most pessimistic person you know. Someone who is always negative. They could be sitting on the beach in the Bahamas with a beautiful, fabulous tropical drink in their hand. Sun is shining, crystal clear ocean, and they're annoyed because lunch hasn't come out yet. You know that kind of person. You've sat next to them at a wedding where the band is awesome, the couple is so cute and happy, families together. And what is this person doing? They're bitching about something, some relative that's sitting all the way on the other side of the room. All they notice is the one thing that's wrong or irritating them. They don't even notice all of the amazing things that are going on around them. Isn't it interesting when I describe this negative, pessimistic person? You know exactly who I'm talking about. And you're probably thinking, dear God, do not sit them next to me at the next family wedding. I do not want to hear this, okay? I do not like that kind of mindset or that mood. I do not want dark colored glasses skewing the way that I enjoy this situation right now. And here's the craziest thing about mindset. You know that pessimistic person you and I were just thinking about? They have no idea that they have dark glasses on. This is just the way they see the world. I'm going to give you another example of mindset and how important this is. I want you to think about someone you work with, or maybe you go to school with this person, who has a can-do attitude. No matter how tight the deadline or how rude the customer is that you guys are waiting on or how much other team members are slacking off, this one person with a can-do attitude, they always see the bright side. Or they have this unbelievable ability to just shrug off the rudeness of other people or the laziness of the students that are on your group project. And they literally can just flip it and turn to you and go, eh, well, you know, they probably have something going on in their personal life. It's as if they always see any situation or any relationship from the positive. They see possibility. They give people the benefit of the doubt. They assume good intent. This too is a mindset. It's just like putting on a rosy pair of sunglasses. Everything is sharper, clearer, brighter when you have this kind of mindset. Even a cloudy, crappy day looks like a beautiful sunrise. In fact, there's a really cool study from the University of Toronto about rose-colored glasses. This isn't just a saying. When you wear rose-colored glasses, your attitude is better. And there's even more based on this research. When you wear rose-colored glasses, you even see more. Your visual horizon is expanded because these rose-colored glasses put you in a good mood. Your mindset determines the way you view the world, and that determines how you think. So I want to do a gut check right now with you. If you had to tell the truth, or actually, let's make this really accurate. If your best friend had to describe the color of the sunglasses that you wear, would they say that you're more on the lane of the dark, bug-eyed, plastic glasses that just skewed everything like it was midnight? Or are you more on the range of everything's rosy? You're always positive. You are always upbeat. You see beauty where most people see nothing. Do a quick gut check with yourself because 
your mindset is critical. It shapes the way you view the world. And that determines how and what you think about. It also determines how you feel about the present moment, about your past and about the future. And most importantly, this is where it gets really important. Your mindset determines what actions you take and what actions you don't take. And it also impacts how you see other people. So for example, if I asked you, so what's your mom like? Before you even answer the question, you subconsciously drop on sunglasses and it filters your opinion about her. And by having a filter about another person, it also limits what's possible for her. You think she just is that way, which means there's no room for her to change. So why is mindset and getting intentional about changing your mindset? Why is this so important? Why do you need to know what color the lens is that you view the world through? And more importantly, why it's time to pop those lenses out if they don't serve you and put in different lenses so that you can see things differently. I'll tell you why your mindset is so important. Because so much of your potential is either limited or expanded by your mindset. I prove to you almost every single episode on the Mel Robbins podcast that with the right attitude and consistent action, you can absolutely change anything about your life or your health or your relationships for the better. And if you're walking around right now with a really negative mindset, you've got those dark bug-eyed glasses on, and you're sitting there every single day telling yourself day in and day out that there is nothing that you can do about this situation, this job, this relationship, this health condition that you've tried, that you've failed, that you don't deserve it, that you don't know how. I want you to consider that your own mindset is keeping you stuck in that broken situation because your mindset is not inspiring you to do anything about it. Being able to spot those dark lenses, pop them out, put in something brighter, rosier, more luminous, it's going to change everything. And here's why. When you feel more hopeful or when you see options and you start to tell yourself, well, why not? Why don't I just try it? What if it works out? Why don't I just see what happens? I do deserve to be happier. I don't deserve to be treated like this. I should start speaking up. That rosier mindset it inspires you to take the actions that change your life. And it's the actions that matter. This is why I love this topic about mindset and what you're about to learn about the filter in your brain so much. Because right now, there are areas in your life where your own mindset is blocking you from taking action. And before we jump into the filter in your brain and changing your mindset, I want to be very clear about something. This conversation today, it's not about positive thinking. You and I are talking about training your mind to work for you. That's very different. This is not toxic positivity. I'm not asking you to put a positive spin on a shitty situation. I'm also very clear that thinking nice thoughts, it's not going to get your bills paid. However, if you can get serious and intentional and strategic about training your mind to have a rosier and more optimistic and empowered attitude, you, my friend, will be able to say to yourself, I can do this. You will be able to say, you know what? I know my student debt is piled from the floor to the ceiling, and I have not opened those bills in approximately 10 months, but I believe in my ability to figure out how to pay this off. If you can, that is an example of how you go from I'm fucked to I can figure this out. When you take off the dark glasses, you know what you'll see? You'll see you're not stuck in the job. You're not stuck in the relationship. You're not stuck with the unhealthy habits that you have. If you're the kind of person that constantly shrugs your shoulders and is like, well, it is what it is. Got this college debt. It is what it is. I always date these losers. It is what it is. My grandfather was heavy. My mother was heavy. I guess I'll just be heavy and feel really bad. About it. No, no. You can look at something differently. And when you look at it differently, you see different options. And I also want to say one more thing before we jump into the filter in your brain and its connection to your mindset. There are things in life that you are not going to change 
or at least you're not going to change them overnight. For example, you and I cannot change that there is discrimination in this world. There is bias and there is violence that a lot of people experience. We cannot change the fact that poverty and mental health issues impact people for real. But here's what you can do. You can train yourself to look at the future and decide how you're going to react to and respond to the, the things that you're facing in your life. You can decide how you're going to heal and what you're going to do about those things for yourself and your community. And one final thing, we have a huge global audience here at the Mel Robbins podcast. And I want you to know if you're listening in another country that I am reading all of the questions that you're submitting through the DMs and through the forums at melrobbins.com. And I see so many of you writing about your desire to create a better life and the fact that it's hard because you're living in Iran or your country is under siege like Ukraine. And I'm going to tell you something. A positive mindset is not going to change the reality of what is going on around you. Here's what it does. And this is why it's important. It empowers you to face it, to deal with it, and to survive it. That's what a mindset does. And that's why it's important to get serious about training your mind to work for you. And this connection between mindset and action, this is so important that I want to give you one more example about how your mindset either inspires action or it discourages it. So let's just say that you are in a job and you hate it. You feel stuck. You feel like you're kind of dead inside. You're not excited about anything. It's day in, day out, the same thing. Or if you're not working right now, and let's say you've taken time off to raise your kids, and you're sitting there going, I want to get back in the workforce, but I don't have any skills, and I've got a 20-year hold in my resume. If your mindset is like those dark, bug-eyed sunglasses that just muddy everything that you see, this is what you're telling yourself. Nobody's going to hire me. I don't have any experience. I don't even know how to write a resume. How the hell am I going to get into interior design when I went to college for accounting and I work in a big accounting firm and I don't even know how to begin doing this? I can't make this happen. If that is the way that you look at the future, if that's your mindset, if you color what's possible through that dark lens, if you keep telling yourself those things, you will see a world where you can't change. So are you going to feel inspired to work on your resume? Of course not. Are you going to feel empowered to start Googling and, and researching and figuring out how to go from an accounting job into interior design? No, because your mindset has stopped you before you even started. And that's why it's critical for you to realize this is not just a conversation about your thoughts. At the end of the day, if you don't have a positive mindset, you and I can talk about actions and habits all day long till we're blue in the face, but you won't do shit about it. I got to get you to have the kind of mindset that also says, hey, it's worth it. Hey, I can do something about this. Because if I can get you to be more optimistic, if I can get you to take the dark lens off and put on a lighter one, if I can get you to start believing, it is worth it for you to apply. It is worth it for you to put your dating app back up. Yeah. It is worth it for you to pick up the pen and start working on that book you've always wanted to write. Hell yes, it's worth it for you to take 10 minutes today and lay down on the floor and do those stretching exercises that the doctor told you you should do because you threw your back out instead of sitting on the couch and bitching about it. Of course it's worth it. If I can get you to start to flip from, ugh, easy for you to say, Mel. Works out for you, doesn't work out for me. It's not going to help. I've had anxiety for years. If I can get you into, hey, Maybe it will work. Hey, maybe I'm ready. Maybe I should try this. Maybe I do deserve this. That singular switch in your mindset motivates you, encourages you to take action. And that's critical because without action, your problems are not going away. Without action, those dreams are not coming through. Without action, you are not healing the crap that's giving you pain. When you change your mindset, it doesn't make those challenges disappear. It changes your ability to face them. And so I'm going to teach 
you and I'm going to teach Brandy. Remember that question? She wants, how do I reset this, Mel? How do I stop doubting myself? Well, I'm going to teach you how to do a mindset reset because the fact is you can change your mindset. You are not stuck with the thoughts that you think. You are not stuck with the way that you feel. You can make your mind a place that supports you. Yes, you can start to see possibility where you never saw any possibility or hope before. I want you to know that when you have the revelation that the voice that you've listened to for years, the voice that's held you back, that made you feel like shit, that it's actually not even yours, that can make your heart seize for a minute. It's kind of one of those like, wait, wait, what? And then when I add on top of it that you're not to blame for the crap that somebody programmed into your head. You were just a little person with three pounds of macaroni that was trying to absorb everything around it. And our brains love patterns and it picks up on patterns of speaking. And that's what your brain did. And so if you're having this revelation, holy shit, I've thought that everything's my fault for my entire life because somebody made me believe it was. And then I held on to that belief. Don't freak out. This is great news because so many people spend their entire lives not even realizing that it's possible to change the way you think. It is possible to put a new playlist in your mind. It is possible to filter the world completely differently and to make your brain work for you. Now, are you going to have positive thoughts all day long? No. Are you going to be like, you know, a thousand percent confident? No. But can you stop torturing yourself? Yes. Can you start encouraging yourself? You better believe you can. Can you separate what your narcissistic piece of shit ex-spouse said to you from what you actually believe about yourself? That you want to believe about yourself? Yeah, you can. Can you do it overnight? No. You're going to have to work at this, just like the people in your past worked over time at saying things to you that beat you down. This stuff takes hold over time. But the good news is your brain is super responsive. And when you combine what you're learning about resetting your mind with healing your nervous system and the science of making and sticking to new habits, all of which you are absolutely smart enough and capable enough to apply to your life because your friend Mel Robbins, I am not going to make this scientific. I'm going to give you the science so that you know this stuff works and you can count on it and trust it. But I make this stuff so dead simple that literally your kids and I can do it. And so you can do everything that you are learning on the Mel Robbins podcast. You can change your mind. You can kick the bully out of your head. You can program in new thoughts. You can actively work to change the reticular activity system in your brain, that network of neurons that filters the world. You can take better care of your brain. And taking care of your physical brain will also help the thoughts in your mind. You can develop new healthy habits using the three simple aspects of a habit based in science and focusing on triggers and rewards. And you can do this. You can make it easier. And you can heal your nervous system, which is the trifecta of transformation. We hit the habits, the mindset, and the nervous system. Holy shit, you're like the terminator of transformation. You could do anything. I, I believe that. I just have way too much evidence to the otherwise. And if you're cynical about that, take a look at who, who taught you to be cynical. Just because life hasn't worked out for you the way that you wanted to up until this point, who fucking says it's not going to work out for you and the best days aren't ahead? I'll tell you who says you do. You decide whether or not you're going to continue 
to let all this crap you're not responsible for to hold you back, or you're going to take responsibility for what happens next. Heal your nervous system. You can do that, and you don't have to spend a dollar. Change your mind. You can do that, and you don't have to spend a dollar to do it. Make new habits. Habits that actually help you get what you want, what you deserve. You can do that, and you do not have to spend money to do it. I would love for you to talk to the person listening and guide them through the process of locating this core memory so that they have that with them as we move forward and you help us define this philosophy that you've created called a rich life. I love it. Let's do it. Okay. So let's start. We're going to start in your early 20s. Okay. And we're going to zigzag throughout our conversation today. We're going to go back to childhood and we're going to go to the future. We'll do it all because that's what money is about. It's about understanding the seasons of life and how money interacts. Oh, I fucking love this. Okay. So, so in my, you know, in my twenties, again, that irrational joy came from being able to buy appetizers. And for everybody here, I want you to think about, you may have been in college. You may have been working at your first job. What was the thing where you said to yourself, I wish I could do that? Or am I ever going to be able to do that? And remember, it's not usually a big thing. It's not, I want to take a round the world trip and stay in all these fancy places. It's often an appetizer. It's uh, being able to pay for your own vacation. It might be, you know, a lot of people joke about it's getting the guac at Chipotle. It might actually be that. There's nothing shameful about a small, vivid aspiration that you had. How do you think everyone listening is is going along with this journey so far, Mel? I think good. Amy? Okay. You think we're good? Okay, good. Yeah. I, I, my producer's like, mm-hmm. This is fantastic. Okay, good. We got, good. like, I think we're all right there. I have a question Perfect. to ask you to go a little deeper in this because I was, I noticed that, you know, you've spent a lot of time studying psychology and you, of course, help people change the way they think think about money. And I would love to ask you about the way in which your formative years as a child and what you experienced as your parents' emotion or conversation around money, how that impacts your mindset around it. And, you know, I'm asking that because I feel like it must be somehow related to this core memory of, I just wish I could go and take myself on vacation. I wish I could buy the guacamole. I wish I didn't have to worry about the needle on the tank of gas getting to empty and not being able to fill it up. And so for me personally, you know, it's interesting. My parents, my, my father, um, was the first person in his family to go to college and Mm. he had to pay for it. And my mother also went to college and had to pay for it. And she ended up dropping out to have me. And then my dad got into medical school and my mom worked nights for the IRS while she and my dad took care of me at night. And then she took care of me during the day. And we lived in public housing while he was a medical student and when he was a resident in Dayton, Ohio. And then my I was in fourth grade when my parents were able to purchase their first home. And my dad did not pay off his medical school loans until late into his 30s. But here's the interesting thing about it. Even though we struggled, and I can relate to the, you know, we never went out to eat when I was a kid, mm-hmm. um, not until middle school anyway, and I never remember my parents being stressed out about money. What do you remember them saying about money? Nothing. I like they didn't I talk I about I, it? I don't I don't remember them talking about it, and I just had this sense because there was this like ease about it that if you need something you figure out how to get it Mm. that there wasn't a lot of griping or complaint and i know they were trying to make the ends meet they come from very blue collar modest families hard working they were very hard working and so i just kind of got this thing like money's there when you work for it and you don't need to worry about it and you know what i mean like i not, not like i was spoiled or anything that was not it at all yeah. But they didn't pass on the stress to me. Now, Chris's family had plenty of money, but there was this huge dialogue. You don't deserve that. We don't have it. 
you're not going to be spoiled. And so his butt is so clenched when it comes to money. Like the guy's like, how much does the guacamole cost? I'm like, dude, have you seen our checking account? You can afford yeah. it. Like he literally adopted this, this kind of gripping mentality how does your what would like how does that impact the mindset that you have your early childhood okay. years so this you just gave us a fantastic uh journey into your childhood and if you don't mind please uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna dive a little bit deep and kind of go, go, uh, go. shine a light on what you just told okay me. okay so a lot of this comes from my work on my podcast and of course on the netflix show with individuals and couples and many people believe that Money is simply about numbers. And of course, the numbers are a very small part of how we experience money. Mm. So um, when you say your family never really talked about money, but there was a sort of ease about it, I I'm, I'm listening, I'm mm -hmm. going okay. And then it clicks when you tell me they were blue collar and they taught us that if you work hard, money will come. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a cohesive belief, I totally agree. Sometimes I speak to couples where one uh, person in the couple grew up, let's say white collar, maybe upper middle class, yep. and the other grew up working class, blue collar. Their beliefs conflict and they can't figure out why, right? They think it's about, oh, she spends too much at Target or he, his truck is too expensive. Mm. But really there's this belief, particularly with different class structures, which mm -hmm. we never really talk about in America, which is, if something's hard, let's just grind harder. And you can grind harder, there's no doubt about that. Law school, at set medical school, but there's a certain point where grinding a little harder just doesn't work. You have to, you have to change the way you think about money. For example, did your parents talk about uh, investing IRAs, compound interest when you were growing up? Oh my God, no. Exactly. And so some of the uh, folks who I speak to, they said we were talking about investing at age five around the dinner table. Here's what happens if you put a quarter in the bank. Now imagine if a couple is meeting and one of them has been talking about investing since age five and the other has never talked about investment. That's what we discover when we peel uh, back the curtain and we see how beliefs affect us. So if you're listening, the question I would ask you is what conversations do you remember your family having when you were young about money? What phrases? Here's some examples that might sound familiar. We can't afford it. Mm. Uh, we don't talk about money in this family. Uh, we're not like those people. We don't need a fancy car vacation eating out. Any of these sound, you heard these or your friends heard these? No, no? but I, I mean, I, I mean, I have heard these. Okay. I'm nodding because I'm like, this is exactly what people hear. Exactly. And so here's the consequence of that. Okay. So you hear the most common one is we can't afford it. Yes. Parents just say this, like it just comes out of their mouth. Parents, you got to stop because let me tell you what happens. They end up 40 years later talking to me and <laughs> they heard we can't afford it 10,000 times growing up just reflexively. Oh, I want shoes. We can't afford it. I want a trapper keeper. We can't afford it. And then this person, hopefully they end up in a pretty nice job. You know, maybe they read my book. They set up some investments. Maybe they've done well. They have some decent amount of money. They come to me to go, why do I still feel guilty ordering a salad when I eat out? Mm. And my partner is saying, we have the money. Look at our checking account. Why? Well, trace it all the way back to conversations you had starting at age six. We can't afford it. And it really shows this key principle of money, which is the way you feel about money is highly uncorrelated to how much you've got in the bank. Okay, say, say again. that again. Yeah. The, the way you feel about money is highly uncorrelated to how much you've got in the bank. Most of us believe if I have $5,000 more or $50,000 more or $500,000, finally, I'll feel safe. And I'm here to deliver some unfortunate news, which is that's never going to happen. Now, you can change the way you feel about money. You can. But a number in the bank is never going to change your feelings about it because it's uncorrelated. You ha you've got to work. If you want to live a rich life, you got to do two things at the same time. One, you got to understand the numbers.
the basic numbers of finance. You've got to know your savings rate. You've got to understand the rule of 72. This stuff is actually not complicated. It's really fun. We could talk about them. I'll give you a couple of ratios. It's easy stuff. It's like a sixth grade. I'm already total. zoning out on that. We'll get to that in a minute. Well, but we'll first, to I want to hear but the second part of this. The second one is you've got to simultaneously work on improving your money psychology. You've got to put a practice into place to start feeling good about money because so much of society tries to get us to feel bad. I love you do this. Those two things, you're going to be doing. I love this well. because whether you're listening right now and you've got millions of dollars in the bank and you're set for life or you are nearly a million dollars in debt like my husband and I used to be over a decade ago, starting with changing your psychology around money changes absolutely everything. And that's what we're going to focus on today because that is something that we all need to do. Even if you've made a ton of money grinding it out, putting your head down, you probably haven't enjoyed it. And there is a way for you to change the way that you think and relate to and the psychology of money so that you have greater freedom, so that you have possibility, so that you're more present, so that you can be more confident uh, and effective in your decision making. And that's exactly what Ramit is teaching millions of people to do. And it's available to all of us, regardless of where we've come from, what class we're in right now, what we've experienced in our lives. We can all just have a zero on the balance sheet and we're gonna go up from here because Ramit's gonna teach us how to change our psychology. So where exactly do we start? Knowing that, that you know everybody comes to this conversation dragging yeah. historical baggage that they might not even be aware of about their relationship to just money and what it means. Yeah. Let's imagine that it's the first day and you've decided to join the soccer team. Okay. People come with, some people have fancy shoes. Some people have no shoes. Some people are really physically fit. Others haven't run at all in years. And for this metaphor, I'll be the coach. Okay. And what I'm going to say is we're all in this together and we're all going to start on the same page. Okay. Okay. So I like to start from a place of we're going to have fun with this. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you what we're not going to do. I'm not going to say uh, he'll pull out this 46 part spreadsheet and let's uh, go through all your spending. Nah, everyone's going to leave. I, and I don't even want to No one. It's irrelevant. Instead, I want to do something, an exercise together with you, me, and everybody listening Okay. about what I call your money dials. So I'm going to ask you, let's do this together. And okay. everybody listening, I want you to follow along. So Mel, if I asked you, what is something you love to spend money on? Not like, but truly love. Look at that smile. What would it be? Oh, I love buying dessert. I, I like now that I've, I've, I've started, you know, I've gotten out of debt. I yeah. make a lot of money. My favorite thing and i always joke that this is my version of a lamborghini uh-huh when i go out with a group of people i order every dessert on the menu okay what does that get you <laughs> tell me about that why um it feels really decadent and fun and it allows me to sample things without committing and yeah. it's a way to um uh take care of everybody at the table because mm -hmm. everybody kind of secretly wished that, you know, <laughs> somebody would order one of the desserts. Yes. And it's a way to relax kind of that grip, like, oh, I'm only allowed one dessert, so I got to pick the one. It's just like a yes. playful way that's kind of ridiculous. But every time I do it, everyone's like, oh, my God, that's so fun. Yeah. And so I just love doing that. And I'm also a massive gift giver. So I love spending my money on other people and orchestrating okay. gifts and creating experiences for people. Those okay. are my two love big it. things. I love it. I hear, I hear so many things that I, I'm so um, thankful I get to highlight some of the things I just heard. So it sounds like your what I would call a money dial, the thing you love is either gifting or eating out desserts. Yes. Would that be fair? Yeah. Okay. Pick one. Which which is the one that gets you really excited? Um 
Gosh, I don't know. Um, I, it's I kind of think it's desserts because you okay, spent like desserts. ten minutes talking okay, desserts, about desserts. Desserts. Yeah. It's it's usually very obvious. Like it, people light up when they talk. Well, about Well, because I also feel like that. it is a gift because nobody it is, does it, it, it for themselves, and it's ridiculous. Okay. Like, why would you order all the desserts knowing everyone's going to take one bite? Because yeah. we can, and because it's fun, and it's very abundant. Yeah, and it's very it's about abundance and play and like that kind of. It makes me feel like a kid almost. Okay, I love it. So. Here we have Mel in like a Willy Wonka chocolate factory, <laughs> just like we get to get it all. And it's very abundant. So for everybody listening, the most common money dial or thing you love to spend money on is eating out. Number two most common is travel. Number three is health and wellness. Number four is convenience, which happens to be my money dial. And there's a variety of others you know, you can search online. Okay, so that's great. For everybody listening, you should identify the thing you love and go into that detail. If you're doing it with a partner, notice how I asked her, why? Tell me what, what does it mean to you? Get curious. And then the second question I have for you, Mel, is if you were able to quadruple your spend on your money dial, what would that look like and feel like for you? I'd send those desserts to everybody in the restaurant. Whoa, tell me more. Um. Just kind of spreading that exuberance and joy mm -hmm. and this kind of psychologically, it's not financially extravagant mm -hmm. if you can afford to do it. Like, it's not like you went out and spent $200,000 on a car, mm -hmm. but there's this level of surprise and exuberance that, and, and, and extravagance that's that that kind of there's delight there's surprise there's the fact that it tastes good that yeah. if i spread that through a whole restaurant i think the mm -hmm. positive vibes that would go out and the positive energy that would swell in that space would be freaking unbelievable amazing okay i'm i'm going to i'm going to ask you to take that and extend it even more oh okay because, because i know you're very successful uh -huh. so you know let's say you eat out once a month you could do that no problem it wouldn't even affect your bottom line Let's turn it up even more, not quadruple, let's 10X it. Think expansively, think beyond the confines of a restaurant. Um, well, the first thing that came to mind was the Ben and Jerry's free cone day. Okay. That they celebrate the, it was this year, their 40th anniversary by having a day where they give everybody a free ice cream cone if they show up. And How they typically support a charity, right? Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. So you would do that? Like a, a day of, let's say, uh, outside of school or something or, or some charity, you're just going to get an ice cream truck and rent it and do that? Well, How when you said school, you? I was like, how cool would it be if, like, everybody got dessert at school for free? Okay. <laughs> You know, I, lo I love your answers. There, There is a cohesive thread that goes through them. It's it's generosity, it's surprise, it's delight, and it just happens to be around food, but I'm willing to bet in your life there's a bunch of other things like that. Yeah. Okay, so for everybody listening, take this example we just heard and apply it to yourself. Let me, let me give you some examples that will help. Please. So uh, for most people, like I said, eating out is their number one money dial. And when I ask them to quadruple it, they almost always say the same, uh, like, PG rated joke. They go, well, I'd probably have to watch what I eat because I'd be eating out four times a week. Ha 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 ha. I go, ha ha ha. And then I go, all right, listen, uh, that's very linear thinking. The fact that you eat out once, so you're going to quadruple it. You're just going to eat out four times. That's linear. Like, okay, you could eat out four times a week, but are you going to eat at the same place? And, and people pause. They start thinking, oh, wait a minute. Okay. So if it's like Chipotle or, or whatever it is that you eat at, wow. Okay, and I remember this um, young man in DC, I was speaking there, and he said the same joke, and I had the same unamused response, and I go, where would you eat? And he thought for a second, and he goes, you know what, I have a list of every Michelin-starred restaurant in DC. Young guy. I go, wow, okay, cool, you like food. He goes, yeah, I love it. I go, who would you take with you? And he got really quiet, the entire audience, pin drop silence, and he goes, I would take my family. Why? because they could never afford to eat at places like that. Now that is a money dial. That mm. is a vision of what you love today. And it could be modest, right? Buying dessert for your friends, that's very generous, but also pretty modest. 
But when you understand, hey, where could I go with this? Could I turn my dial up 2x, 4x, 10x? What would it look like? It wouldn't just be more of the same. I might change the quality. I might change the frequency. If I love clothes, as a young woman in Pasadena did, I asked her, are you going to still shop at the same place, H&M? She goes, no. And when we really explored and played, we came up with this idea that one day she could fly to Italy with her mom and they could get something custom made together in Italy. Now, she can't do that today. She can't do it tomorrow. But now she has a vision of what excites her with money. That's how we get started. Why is it important? to start with a vision that's exciting. Because money is such a drag for most of us. When you think of money, what are the first words that come to mind? Debt. <laughs> yep, yep. R restriction, overwhelming. Mistakes. Am I too late? Mistake. It sucks. So are we surprised that Americans have terrible financial behavior? Well, I'm not really surprised when everything around us basically tells us don't pay attention to this until it's too late. I mean, it's more exciting to talk about flossing than it is to talk about money. It sucks. But if we start talking about, oh my God, I love to eat. I'm unapologetic about spending extravagantly on the things I love, as long as I cut costs mercilessly on the things I don't. Well, suddenly it's a lot more fun to talk about. It really is because I think there's so much shame that we carry about money because there's all these expectations that you have about how much you should have, how much you should have by now, what you should have done with it. If only had I invested back uh, in the day in Apple, like I missed yeah. these opportunities, I should have done this, I should have done that. And that sort of negative story that you keep reinforcing to yourself that then has you go, oh, I can't buy the guacamole, I better not get a latte, fuck, fuck, fuck. Yeah. It keeps you stuck in that story. But when you allow yeah, somebody we, to play and dream again, because money, it's not only psychology, it's sort of a vehicle to do those things. Exactly. Yeah. And you, I love what you said about the, the guacamole example is that because we feel shame, because we feel like it's too late, we our, our field of vision narrows, almost like if you've ever felt like you're mm. about to faint, everything shrinks and we shrink our own desires. So I'll often ask people, what is your rich life? And you know what they always say to me? They always go, I want to do what I want, when I want. I go, oh, God, there we okay. Go. Uh, and then I go, wow, that's so interesting. I never heard that one except for the 8 million times I heard it. I go, so what do you want? And they are stumped because we never actually thought about what our rich life is. And so then I, you know, I'm gentle. I want them to come to it, but I also want to have a little fun with them. Yep. And so they'll say something like, well, I guess like, you know, it would be cool if I had a beach house one day, but it doesn't have to be a big beach house. It could be small. It could be a shack. It could be dilapidated. I don't even need anything. I go, what the hell? We're talking about your rich life and you already shrunk your desires in five seconds? Uh-uh, I don't allow that. I go dream bigger and then let's figure out if your finances support it, what investments you'd need to make. And hey, maybe you're not gonna get a nine bedroom place in the Hamptons, but maybe you could get a beautiful place, rent it for a week or buy it in 10 years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we minimize ourselves unnecessarily. And then that cuts off our access to authentic inspiration. Yeah. It, it, nobody's inspired by a tiny vision. Nobody's inspired by the idea like, ooh, I could save 5% on coffee. Who cares? That's not exciting. <laughs> what can we do to improve our memory, Dr. Amen? Well, improve your brain. It's like the most important thing, uh, you know, it's 50%. I mean, think about this, Mel. 50% of people 85 and older will be diagnosed with dementia. Uh, like those are odds I am not okay with. And if you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. And I know we don't have time to go in it, but the mnemonic I have is bright mind. So for example, maybe the most important thing, B is for blood flow. Whatever okay. you can do to increase blood flow to your brain, you're gonna be happier, your memory is gonna be better, and you're gonna be more sexual because whatever Ooh, is good for your brain, brain, good for your heart, is good for your genitals. 
So is that the brisk walking? So, so you want to avoid things that steal blood flow, caffeine, nicotine, being sedentary, having any form of heart disease. And then you want to do things that enhance blood flow. So walking, um, raw cacao, beets, the supplement ginkgo. These things all increase blood flow. Cinnamon, oregano. Wow. Okay. Um, I want to hear the R though. Bright mind. I know that we that that there's eleven, but give me two or three of them. The R is retirement and aging. When you stop learning, your brain starts dying. So constantly engage in new learning. The I is inflammation. But the one maybe to talk about more is the T, it's toxins. And we live in a toxic society, right? Here I am in Florida. I just talked about all the fish off the coast in Florida. On average, they have seven pharmaceuticals in their tissues. But just the products you put on your body, I have all of my patients download the app, Think Dirty. It allows you to scan all of your personal products and it'll tell you on a scale of one to 10, how quickly they're killing you. Oh my and God. We saw this year that the FDA took off a number of sunscreens off the market because they were associated with cancer. How horrifying is that, right? You're thinking you're protecting yourself from cancer. The toxic products are giving you cancer. Um, so think dirty, but also we have to stop thinking of alcohol as a health food. It's not, it's toxic to your brain or marijuana is innocuous. It's not, it damages your brain. And, you know, it's these little lies in our society hmm. that is really promoting the disease we are um, just flooded with. So you've been a psychiatrist for 40 years. What are five things you'd never do because it's bad for your mental health and your brain health? Well, I never believe every stupid thing I think. And I think that's really important to know, you know, I'm going to get these crazy, stupid, awful thoughts, and I know how to manage and dismiss them. I would never say everything I think. Some people come, in, come to me and say, oh, Dr. Amon, I'm brutally honest. And I'm like, well, that's usually not helpful. <laughs> Relationships require that. I would never purposefully stay up late and screw up my sleep. I would never eat everything I want. And I would never take medicine just based on symptom clusters. Like, you know, I'm depressed, so take an antidepressant. So I think that's all insane. I always want to look at the brain and then target whatever treatment I need to how somebody's brain's function. Yeah. The one thing I forgot to ask you, because, um, you know, right now, as you and I are talking, we've just turned the clocks back, but this time of year, when it gets darker earlier and it's colder, I notice like my mood drops and I feel like sad. What do you do, whether it's because of the time of year or because of chronic stress, you feel this sort of languishing or heaviness set in? What are three things that you would recommend that somebody do to boost their mood? So morning bright light, I think that can be really helpful. So you know, bright my, uh, a bright light therapy lamp for 20 or 30 minutes in the morning, exercise, don't overdo the caffeine. And it's really important, we haven't talked about this yet, turn off blue light when the sun goes down. So what is blue light? Constantly flooded with blue light. And in the morning, it's fine, but after dark, it's not because it decreases the production of melatonin. So you get it from your laptop or you get it from your phone or you get it from whatever gadgets you might be looking at. And so after dark, either put blue light blockers on your gadgets 
or just turn them off and go read a book. Okay, great. And, you know, I didn't, I also didn't ask you this. How do you know if your dopamine levels are low? If you're tired, if you're unmotivated, if you can't concentrate and you find yourself more impulsive than it's good for you. Mm. And finally, let's bottom line, because you are the master at elite brain training. If you could leave everyone with just one thing that you would like them to start doing today to create better brain health, what would it be? It's that mother tiny habit. It's whenever you come to a decision point in your day, just ask yourself, and what I'm doing, good for my brain or bad for it? And if you can answer that with information and love, I mean, I'm serious about this, love of yourself, love of your family, love of the reason you're on earth, you're gonna start making good decisions for your brain and then everything in your life will be better. How do you know if you're getting enough sleep based on the things that you study? Yes. Because you um, hear eight hours. Yeah. How many, how many hours do you sleep, by the way? Um, the older I get, the more boring I am. <laughs> so I would say nine or 10. Yeah. I love that. Um, people who sleep less than six hours have a uh, higher mortality. They have lower mood, um, and they ha are hungrier, as we said, with the leptin. Huh. Um, what you want to do is really to realize how much sleep you need is when you sleep without an alarm, how many hours do you sleep? And not when you're sleep deprived. But oh, I bet I sleep 10 hours. Yeah. That's... If I don't have an alarm on, I sleep way longer than I think I'm going to. When you look at the last couple of weeks of your life, yes. the best days, the when you felt the most refreshed, the best mood. Or were the days I got the best, um, the highest amount of sleep? That's By how far. Much, that's how much sleep you need. And every American that's listening to this is going to be like, I can't sleep that much. But you think about your best days of your life happened when you slept adequately. It changes your hunger hormones. It changes your hormones in general, you know, for women, especially as we get older, um, this is important. It changes your mood. It changes your ability to uh, uh, make decisions. Yeah. And your interactions with other people. So why would you want to skimp on that? Why would you say that you'll be like everybody else, you know, sleep when you're dead. When you look <laughs> at the data... The data says opposite. It says if you don't sleep, you'll be dead much earlier. That's true. If you don't sleep, you will be more depressed, more anxious, have more uh, hunger and craving signals. You are going to be a version of yourself that is, is a shell of what you want to be. So one final thing that I think would be extremely helpful to people. Let's assume that we went to bed early. And we wake up and we get a good night's sleep. Can you walk us through what you would recommend the eating routine or what is on our plate and when are we actually eating? Okay. For Mel uh, for like, you know, complete hormone yes. balance. Yes. Um, okay. So as you know, it's everybody is different and yep. their life circumstances are different. Every time I do this, uh, you know, people say, oh, but I work night shift or right. I have little kids. I get it. Like life is, I had many years where I didn't get enough sleep, where I didn't get enough sunlight, where I couldn't make the best decisions because I was just so pulled in, um, you know, all the different directions. Uh -huh. So I get it. But we didn't even talk about circadian rhythms, but Mel, sunlight and darkness run our bodies. We have internal clocks in every one of our cells. So routines are excessively important okay. in terms of our mood and our, um, our body, our nutrition. So when you wake up in the morning, you want to get sunlight. I have a rule that I learned um, 
from someone online. Basically, I did this for a few days and I felt the best I've ever felt. And I'll tell you what it is. When you wake up, instead of scrolling your phone, yep. checking your messages and your emails, go get sunlight first. Sky before screens. Oh, I love that. So sky before screens is how you should start your day. Your body is wired to see sunlight in the morning. Even if it's a cloudy day, it just has to be bright light. Okay. Uh, you can just walk out outside. For me, it's my back door. Just walk out for a few minutes. It could be two to 10 minutes. You could do, um, for me, I'm usually just in my pajamas. So I'm coming back in and getting ready for the day. Okay. So you don't want to have food or caffeine in the first 45 minutes of your day. Why? I'll tell you why. When you wake up, you feel groggy, right? Yep. That grogginess is partially, mostly from adenosine in your brain. Adenosine. Adenosine. Okay. And it clears out, as you know, within 30, 40 minutes, mm. it clears out. Then you have your coffee. Then you eat your food. And the reason why is coffee, the way it works, it, it blocks our adenosine receptor. So that means that it doesn't help get rid of the adenosine. It just blocks it from from actually binding. Okay. So if you don't let the adenosine clear out and you just drink your coffee, when the coffee wears off in a couple of hours, that adenosine's still there. And it just oh. binds those receptors and you feel excessively tired. And that's why you think you need another cup of coffee. And then you're fully dependent, like the people that wake up and they need the coffee right then, and then they need it again at like 10 o'clock, and then they need it again at one o'clock, it's because you're not letting that adenosine Whoa. go. Okay. You need to let that clear out. I'm guilty of this. So yes. I am going to try this tomorrow. I am going to absolutely have my coffee and then, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to wake up. I'm going to wait 45 minutes. Yes. Then I'm going to have my coffee. I'm going to see if I have a craving for a second cup. Yes. That is fascinating. Okay. So you want to let it uh, clear out naturally because it's not going to clear out naturally if you start the caffeine cycle right away. Got okay? it. So clear it out for 45 minutes. Get our sun in. What's next? Um, eat. Okay. So No intermittent fasting. So everybody, I love intermittent fasting. Then why are we eating? Because I do it the opposite way. Talk to me. There's very good evidence that for thousands of years, we ate in one scheduled way. Okay. Which is daylight hours. Oh. There was no microwaves, Uber Eats, you know. There was they had a fire and you'd maybe eat an hour or two after sundown. That's it, right? Yeah. You are not snacking at midnight. There's nothing, there's nowhere to store the food thousands of years ago. Our internal clocks are set so that when melatonin hits two to three hours before bed, your organs shut down. Mm. You cannot process sugar as well as you did. You can't take it into your muscles. You are not uh, processing, you're not releasing digestive enzymes. So basically when you're eating late at night, you are waking your body up in the middle of the night and asking it to do a math problem. Your body is going to be like, I don't want to do this. I'm going to make mistakes. Yep. You wake up and you're tired and you're pissed that someone woke you up in the middle of the night. That's what happens when you eat late at night. Holy smokes. You put your body in conflict with itself. Yeah. And so intermittent fasting, everyone's doing it the wrong way. They're eating way late into the night and then they don't eat all day when the sun is out, right? Like that's the time that you want, your body's ready for food, right? So ideally, you know, you wait an hour because it's, it, nobody needs to be eating every minute of every day. Yep. Uh, Americans just, we just eat 14 to 16 hours a day. It's just too much, right? So you wake up, maybe you get some movement in, you get your sunlight, you eat about an hour or two even after you wake up. You don't okay. need to push it to two, three, four o'clock. Like people are doing this thing. There's good evidence that skipping meals is actually bad for you and that people who do it habitually actually have worse health outcomes, okay? Got it. So eat your breakfast. You want to have a high dopamine breakfast. Yep. Uh, let's have, you know, cottage cheese, eggs, tofu scramble, veggies, nuts, berries. Okay. Great. When do I eat next? Then you I'm eat. already hungry. Yeah. Well, no. I, am I hungry right now? Yeah. 
Are would you I hungry? eat vegetables? I would eat vegetables there right you now. Go. So then that must hungry. mean I'm hungry. But I got to have a glass of water first, and then I'm going to ask myself that Are again. You, yes. So See, can, I'm learning. Then you tune in with the inner Mel, you know, the, the yep. brain gut Mel. Yep. Okay. So then you can eat when you're hungry. Again, you can use your inner cues. Could be 12, could be one. Whatever your inner cues, okay. you'll notice your ghrelin is set to, uh, to on a timer. Every day you'll get hungry at the same time. So hello ghrelin. Yeah. It just dumped on. It just it just I think dumped on me. Yeah. So what do you eat for lunch? So basically, lunch is a chance for you to get f- the more the healthier you eat earlier in the day, the better your chance of um, sticking to it. So okay. they always say exercise and eating healthier foods, breakfast and lunch is your best chance. So for me, okay. I automated and I had already talked to you when we had talked before that I try to eat the same things every day. So what do you eat for lunch? So I eat a salad for lunch. I usually put a protein source on it. It could be different beans, nuts, it could tofu, you could do eggs, you could do salmon, whatever you want, protein and veggies, a salad with um, protein on it. And, the, and I always have a fermented probiotic food with my lunch because that's the best time for you to get in at least one to two servings of the kimchi of the sauerkraut it could be um, kombucha for a you know a drink Um, apple cider vinegar in your dressing yep so that's when you have the best chance really simple it can be very simple and then your dinner is when you want to eat. If you Serotonin, are someone, baby. yes, you're learning. I'm paying attention. So um, if I know it's not sexy to say eat carbs, but carbs actually can be very healthy for you, especially in vegetable form, sweet potato, quinoa, whatever it is. Um You can eat that later in the day if you want to have that big boost of serotonin. And what about snacks? If I'm like legit hungry, but I'm not really craving anything. Yes. But I'm legit hungry midday. What's your go-to snack? So remember that protein has this effect on your body that it tells your hunger to hunger hormones to stop. So if you want more leptin, eat more protein. So your snack can be yogurt. Your snack can be a protein shake. Your snack can be um, a a piece of cheese. It can, you know, something with protein because that will keep your dopamine levels up and it will keep your hunger hormones hormones stable. So protein snack, I think women especially, we're eating just too little protein. There is a theory that the reason we get fat from eating ultra processed food is because it's so low in protein that your brain never gets the signal that you're full. Your protein threshold is never met. Wow. One final thing I want to ask you, because we didn't really cover it, gluten. Everybody I know is gluten-free. Yeah. It's not the gluten. There's very few people who are actually allergic to gluten. It is very common to have GI issues with processed gluten, so when you eat a lot of bread, pizza, carbs, but that's not the gluten itself. It's the fact that you're eating processed mm. food. So gluten gets mislabeled all the time. What I say to people is go gluten-free for a few weeks, three to four weeks. Okay. See how you feel. When you add the gluten back, don't add back the bread, the cookies, the cakes, and the processed gluten. Add back a small wheat bulgur, like in a in a salad. Okay. Um, add back um, a healthy sourdough bread. Okay. Add back, you know, wheat in small, unprocessed amounts, and then see how you feel. And what I realize is that people villainize gluten all the time, and in America, gluten free um, has become such a tagline that those foods are. Uh, more unhealthy. Oh, because of all the processing. Look at you, Dr. <laughs> Amy. Is there anything else on this topic that we did not get? I think we covered so much. I I think, um, like you said, and I have taken this to heart, is that there is no pill that's going to save you. There is no person that's going to save you. You, when you learn about all this, when you actually listen to your own self, you are going to be the one who saves yourself. Well, Dr. Amy Shaw, (laughs) let me just say thank you. Because without this information, we can't save ourselves. And you've explained the internal 
extremely elegant but complicated systems inside of us so that it makes sense, so that we understand why these choices, these substitutions, why it actually matters. Like that's my huge takeaway. I have never actually understood any of this at the level that you just explained. And that's an enormous gift. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.